More than a quarter of a century ago, our guest today published a book about the future of technology called Life After Television. Quote, the computer of the future will be as portable as your watch and as personal as your wallet. It will recognize speech and navigate streets, collect your mail and your news. Close quote. Our guest is worth listening to today, in other words, in large measure because he got so much right back then. His new book, Life After Google. George Gilder on Uncommon Knowledge Now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. One of the nation's most important public intellectuals for more than four decades now, George Gilder is the author of 19 books. His 1980 bestseller, Wealth and Poverty, made a fresh argument for capitalism and became the volume that Ronald Reagan quoted more than any other. Other Gilder works, Knowledge and Power, The Scandal of Money, and Life After Television, which I mentioned just a moment ago. George Gilder's newest book, Life After Google, The Fall of Big Data and the Rise of the Blockchain Economy. George, welcome. Great to be here, Peter, as always. George, in Life After Google, you refer to Google, the company that all of us use for search and Gmail and mapping. You refer to Google, this marvel, as neo-Marxist. What on earth do you mean by that? Well, a lot of people don't really understand what Marxism was. The key error of Marxism was Karl Marx's belief that the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century was a final human attainment, a kind of eschaton, that uh, the problem of productivity and wealth creation had been solved forever. The end of and, history of his day, so to speak. Yeah, and from then on, uh, the only challenge would be how to distribute wealth rather than how to create it. Well, Google Marxism just repeats uh, Karl Marx's error with the new technology. Uh, Google believes that their AI, artificial intelligence, their machine learning, their robotics, their algorithmic biology, their search, uh, and their solutions uh, constitute a new eschaton, a new final achievement of human beings. It's even more grandiose than Carl's original vision and that the Google people imagine a singularity where the machines will eclipse human minds and allow all of the rest of us to retire on beaches and and collect a guaranteed annual income, the new fashion in Silicon Valley, while Bren and Page uh, fly off with Elon Musk to some remote planet in a winner-take-all universe. And I just, uh, I think this is delusional. Uh, uh, Google faces impossible business problems, uh, contradictions in their strategy, flaws in their technology, uh, misunderstandings of the very computer science that underlie all their technology. I, th I think uh, Google, uh, uh, Google is having a nervous breakdown. Oh, I just want to make sure I heard this right. You just called Larry Page and Sergey Brin these geniuses who 20 years ago, who in 20 years have gone from zero to a company with a market cap of 870 billion at market close yesterday. You just called them delusional. I heard that right? Yep. Oh, there, there, oh, there are a lot of delusional, brilliant Marxists in the world. All right. Uh, don't you encounter them all the time? <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, you're, you live at Stanford. Before We will return to your attack on Google, but first, how did Google do it? We just agree, 19, the company's founded in 1998, so we go from zero, non-existence, mm -hmm. 20 years ago, and even two decades ago, to a market cap of, as I said, between 800 and 900 billion, depending mm -hmm. on the market close the day people listen to us, uh, which is, makes it the second most valuable enterprise on the face of the planet. Apple just crossed a trillion dollars in valuation. So the question is, how did they do it? It isn't a 
accomplishment of some kind. Oh, it's an absolutely fabulous accomplishment. They, they dominated this era. This is the Google era. We live in it. Uh, but uh, the next step is to upload your mind into the Google Cloud. And I said, I uh, balk at this next right. step in the Google system of the world. You, you spent some time in Life After Google ex describing the DALS, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, yeah, the, yep, the, which is the huge Google data center up in Oregon. In Life After you, Google, you write of the diminishing returns of big data. So let me understand yeah. if I, let me make sure I understand at least one part of your argument correctly. The delusions come next. First, there are certain physical, almost physical constraints. We've reached the point now at which, no matter how big your data center, improvements in parsing data are only going to be incremental. Mm -hmm. It's going to be difficult to get enough power. It's going to be difficult to cool these machines adequately, mm -hmm. which is why Google's big center is up at the Dalles because there's a huge dam there, which means cheap hydroelectric yeah. power and cold water for cooling. So that's argument number one. They, they're bumping into physical limitations. Is that correct? I, I, I th this is a symbol. Uh, the, the Dalles and all their data centers parked like aluminum plants uh, beside big bodies of water or near glaciers or various other means of cooling just like uh, an industrial plant of the previous era. And, uh, and I, th I think that uh, this cloud computing, which was, which was a great triumph for its time and dominated its time, is now reaching the end of the line. Uh, a great computer scientist named Gordon Bell ordained a proposition called Bell's Law, which is that Every 10 years, Moore's law, which is the doubling of computer power every year, yields a hundred to thousand fold rise in total computer capability and requires a completely new computer architecture. Uh, I wrote about the cloud first. I hailed the cloud in an article in Wired in 2006. And, uh, and said that it would dominate the next Bell's Law phase. Uh, but it's now 12 years since 2006, and uh, that Bell's Law regime of cloud computing, huge data centers all uh, just, parked I, by, by bodies of water is coming to an end. Okay, I just want to tie, make sure that I understand this. I, I want to emphasize this because I think I'm right about it. Cloud computing, I don't know who the genius was, maybe I'm talking to him now, who first conceived of the notion of the cloud because it puts in the mind of the ordinary user the sense that somehow or other computing has now become ethereal, it just, it's just up yeah. there. It's not up there, it's in big industrial scale operations at the Dalles in Oregon and other, so the- 80 different sites around the world I think Google has now, okay. a big, big, Data so centers. the cloud isn't the cloud, it's factories essentially of huge yeah. computers. That's yeah. correct? Yes. All right. You refer, again, let me quote Life After Google. Google is not just a company. It is a system of the world. That is a phrase that is important yeah. in this book. Google is a system of the world. What do you mean by that? Well, a system of the, I think the first sort of great system of the world that unleashed the miracles of the industrial age and the British empire and of the pr previous era was Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. And he both uh, developed the calculus and the key laws of Newtonian physics and then proceeded to establish as master of the mint in Britain, the gold standard. And uh, this together, the calculus, the physics, the gold standard were really the pillars of the industrial era and Britain's amazing global dominance from a small island. And, and that was <coughs> a great system of the world. It was implicitly deterministic. And, and uh, 
And, Explain that term. How do you mean deterministic? It, because Newton, it, Newton was 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 a Christian. Newton uh, was uh, a uh, Christian and believed in free will, but his physics and his calculus implied a deterministic model. You know that that. Uh, uh, if you did this, then this must happen. Yeah, that's right. That this action could, re requires that reaction. Right. right. A okay. hermetically sealed uh, system that uh, always reproduces the same results with the same inputs, uh, a predictable scheme. And this system of the world was essentially overthrown by Kurt Gödel. Uh, Kurt Gödel is born in Austria. He's an Amer He comes to this country. His dates are late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, yeah, roughly. His, his great moment at age 23 or 4 was in 1930 when uh, he addressed uh, the great meeting at Konigsberg in Austria uh, that was going to establish mathematics as a complete system that could explain everything implicitly. If you had all the data it, and you had the mathematical algorithms, uh, you could uh, predict the entire future from the past. Uh, this was uh, the great dream. And, and he permanently overthrew it with Gödel's incompleteness theory. He showed that any logical system whatsoever is necessarily dependent upon propositions that can't be proven within the uh, logical system. And, sh and, and in proving this, he, he really invented a kind of computer software system where all the propositions uh, and variables were expressed in numbers. So his proof uh, that uh, mathematics could not be coherent and completely consistent, that it depended on outside propositions, axioms, uh, was uh, a major breakthrough and, uh, and, and also established the computer age. Turing, Alan Turing, then went on and took Gödel's formula and transformed it into uh, a universal computer architecture, a Turing machine, and Turing machines are also dependent on oracles outside the machine to program them. Okay. Now so, Google says it has a system of the world where it's returning back to the deterministic realm, and and uh, with big data they can predict everything. Uh, all the answers can be. Uh, extracted from their aggregations so of big you, data. You're, do, uh, you're doing something that you do again and again in life after Google. You're operating on two levels. On one level, you're talking about technology. And Kurt Gödel, in developing these incompleteness theorems in 19, in he's working on it in the 20s, and the, con, the, big, the big moment takes place in 30, is that correct? So 1931 in 31. Okay. And he d develops mathematical tools on the way to proving his point, he develops mathematical tools which form the basis of computer software language. Yeah. So that's the technolo technological point that George Gilder is making. But you are also always arguing about, I won't say theology, yeah. because you're not really taking on God, yeah. but you are arguing the deep structure of reality. Yeah. What is reality really like? Yeah. And so there are pages here that make me scratch my head because you're talking about technology and math and that's hard for me. And then there are pages that make my brain explode because you're talking about reality itself. But I want to come back to this point. Gödel proved that there can be no human construct, no human system of thought that does not rely on some reality outside itself. That's right. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. And, and for th theological interest, Gödel desperately feared that he might have proved the existence of God. Ah, all right. He and Einstein used to walk together through the streets of Princeton discussing theology uh, derived from these cerebrations. Both nervous that they may have 
they may have been onto something even bigger than they, I see. All right. That's book number 20 for you, George. But, but right. back, to, back to book number 19. One other point about Google that you make, a, a shortcoming for Google, is that it gives everything away for free. And you, which, of course, I used... I spent I sent 10 emails this yeah. morning on, on Gmail for free. I haven't started my my research for the afternoon, but I'll be using Google and it'll be for free. Yeah. OK, this is all wonderful. As far as I can tell, George Gilder in Life After Google not only is free a lie, but a price of zero signifies a return to the barter system or a morass that the human race left behind in the Stone Age. Well, now I am confounded. How can these, this marvel of technology be dragging us back to the Stone Age? Well, because of free, there are two key points about free. First of all, it avoids the price system. So uh, it avoids uh, liabilities to customers that you actually have to serve because the customers have paid you. It avoids uh, the requirement of security because who wants to steal something that's free? Uh, it doesn't completely avoid the obligations of security, but uh, it, it essentially uh, greatly relieves the problems of constantly conducting secure uh, transactions with customers to whom you owe something. And it also prohibits learning uh, because the key to uh, capitalism is learning curves. Uh, uh, as I told you in my last meeting here, uh, uh, wealth is knowledge. And if wealth is knowledge, economic growth is learning. And uh, one of the key instruments of learning in a capitalist system is the signal of prices. And by giving away all its products for free, Google avoids this precarious process of falsifiable learning that is the heart of capitalist growth. So by giving away products for free, they avoid the security challenge to a great extent. They avoid direct liabilities and responsibilities to real customers. And, and, they, you said, and, they, you... and they avoid the learning process that uh, allows capitalist growth. When you say they avoid the security problem, the security problem you have in mind is what we all now feel every time we go on the web. We're afraid of identity theft. We're afraid of being hacked. We get e we get alerts from Google itself saying, Constant. were you this user? Was that you who checked in and uh, changed your yeah. password? The feeling that we're naked before, who knows, unknown faceless mm -hmm. enemy. That's yeah. the security problem yeah. they're avoiding because if they give things away for free, security patches yeah. are good enough. That's the, pro that's that's, the point? That's, yeah, but the fact is uh, security is not a video game. Uh, security is an architecture. And uh, the existing computer architecture of which Google is the paramount exponent is failing. Okay. It's uh, filling the internet with clutter. It's uh, failing with uh, the smartphone. 30% uh, of your payments uh, for smartphone services go to download ads that you don't want to see. Want. Uh, you really don't want these ads on your smartphones. They are not uh, ads, they are minuses. And uh, only 0.06% of these smartphone ads are clicked on. And uh, according to surveys, 50% of these clicks, approximately, are in error. So only 0.03% of smartphone ads are actually desired. And, and this is, uh, and this is a, a catastrophe. This is, this is not a viable business, and uh, Google is running come into the end of the line in smartphone advertising. It's trying to move from search, where it uh, 
it serves the rest of the Internet to solutions where Google is the answer man in the sky and it's AI with its increasing accumulation of big data can answer all your questions. Uh, but that is, uh, that's where I uh, make the charge of delusional state. All right, the new system of the world. Again, life after Google. The, this very lack of concern with security will be Google's undoing. For every other player on the net, every other player on the net, the lack of security is the most relevant threat to its current business model. This problem will be solved. So fundamental will security be to the new system that its very name will be derived from it. It will be the cryptocosm. Explain that term. The cryptocosm is, refers to this amazing providential efflorescence of creativity that's erupted all around the world to supply a new architecture for the internet and indeed, ultimately, a new architecture for the entire world economy. At a very time that the system of central banks with its $5.1 trillion a day of currency trading that doesn't even arrive at settled currency values or significant currency values. And the architecture of the internet, which uh, uh, requires you to expose yourself strip naked virtually before the cameras in order to conduct a transaction. You have to, your passwords, pins, your usernames, your last four numbers of your social security, uh, your mother's maiden name, your first school, your favorite pet, your, you know, this, your irises, your uh, DNA, you know, this method of, of uh, authenticating people to participate in internet transactions is bankrupt. Uh, they, they may imagine that this is a pl viable system, but it isn't. It is, it is failing every day, and it's going to be replaced by the cryptocosm, by the blockchain, right. by a whole s series of technologies deriving from the blockchain. Right. So but, but I, I, I want to use security is I'm quoting again. Security is not a procedure or a mechanism. It is an architecture. The cryptocosm will start by defining the ground state. You don't build the building. You build the foundation, the ground state. It is the ultimate non-random reality. The ground state is you. Yeah. The ground state is you. Explain that. Well, the ground state uh, in the cryptocosm is, is your... Uh, your private key, uh, which uh, validates you as your DNA identifies you. It's uh, so this is not a, this isn't a, this isn't you, you're not overreaching for the sake of argument. You are saying that in the cryptocosm, blockchain technology will permit us all to have some kind of unimpeachable ID, which is as as individual to us and as undecryptable as our DNA. Correct. Okay. Wow. All right. And it, you'd better explain, it's, and here I brace, yeah. here I'm just going to hold the table with yeah. both hands. You'd better explain for the layman, yeah. I'll give you a short paragraph, yeah. blockchain. Okay. What is blockchain? Make Block, me understand Blockchain that, is a new architecture, new security architecture for the internet that, dis, that allows you to keep your information to yourself and uh, it distributes all the personal information all across the uh, network, just as human intelligence is distributed across the world uh, in individual human brains. It's not agglomerated in giant data clumps. It's uh, human intelligence is distributed. The blockchain distributes personal data uh, rather than concentrating it in one of the few big walled gardens, Google, like Facebook, the Dallas, okay. what, what, concentrating it, and, and then uh, forcing you to petition to the uh, big centralized database for the right to be yourself on the internet. It, it, uh, it's a distributed, uh, way of uh, you keep your data to yourself and use 
whatever data you need uh, to conduct a particular transaction. But it's, it's, it's as it, it originated as a form of money, Bitcoin. Right. right. But it's, and it's often compared to cash because it seems to allow anonymity. Yes. But, the, but it's really better than cash. It's, it's a major step forward beyond cash, because not only does it allow you to conduct anonymous transactions, it also enables you to demonstrate your behavior and your transactions unimpeachably, if you have to, to the IRS, to a prosecutor, to Preet Bahara, or whoever it may be. You, uh, the blockchain gives you an immutable record that, that allows you to document your behavior. And, and it, it's always seemed to me that the key thing isn't uh, really privacy, isn't really as critical as being able to prove that you didn't do something that, that uh, a government wants to charge you with doing, you know, that uh, the ability to, of attestation is an important advance that the blockchain offers, both in third world countries and, and in the United States. All right, so your, your limited claim in Life After Google is that we have a new technology coming along that will make use of my smartphone and my desktop and your smartphone and your desktop and distribute transactions and intelligence and in some ways meaning across everybody's smartphones and computers and, and, and it, will make, it will render Google's fantastically huge investment in these 80 different data centers, it will render those Beside the point, perhaps. Yeah. Right. Well, we're very like those big uh, abandoned uh, aluminum plants that you can see up the dowels. Okay. That's the limited claim. Here's the larger claim that box chain, blockchain can fix a lot of what's wrong with America. Life after Google, blockchain technology will address the doldrums of centralization, insecurity, and sclerosis afflicting the current information economy. Okay, now give. Yep. How's that? How's that? IPOs are down. This is the Peter yeah. Thiel argument that we're just not getting the innovation that it feels as though we should have, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, how does blockchain jumpstart that, the whole economy? Well, it's because blockchain corresponds with the reality of the world, which is the ultimate thinking element is the human mind, individual human minds, each one different, each one uh, with a potential of its own, uh, which can make its own contribution. And, and uh, blockchain is an answer to this cloud mind, which uh, I call sky computing, which you described so well with the computers and smartphones all around the world, contributing their cycles as needed to uh, perform supercomputer computations as required or 3D rendering from the internet, uh, that is uh, having uh, 3D uh, experiences provided across the internet, all from the skies, open skies, rather than from the clouds of Google, Facebook, and uh, the rest of the giants, a Apple and Amazon, and the, which are the biggest companies in the world and a tremendous Achievement. upset. I'm, right. not, I'm not for any kind of attacks on them. I'm of, of government regulation or whatever. I don't think that that's the problem at all. I think the problem is that, is that uh, they have a business plan and a technological solution that's inappropriate to a world full of individual human minds. Okay, so here's your argument then. Your argument is the ultimate resource, the base of it all, is not any human construct, still less anything that has such a centralizing tendency as these huge data centers that we began by discussing. Yeah. Your argument is no, 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 no. It's the individual. The individual 
is the resource. Yeah. And blockchain will empower individual yeah, human right. beings. Individual human beings in conditions of economic and political liberty are resources and blockchain will empower them. That's right. I've that's got, okay. well put. That's, that's the well, conclusion. I've, I've been reading book. you for 35 and, and, years, and, and George. It, and it, and it uh, is already happening. I mean, yet you, you mentioned the IPO crisis, you know, the 90% drop in the number of IPOs, the 50% shrinkage of the number of, more than 50%, 60% shrinkage of the number of public companies uh, on the stock market. Uh, uh, this uh, we're having a stock market boom while the number of companies shrinks drastically and new challengers don't rise up IPOs uh, but uh, um, a Teal fellow you mentioned Peter Teal yes. who is a pivotal figure in life after Google Peter uh, Teal has created these Peter the Teal, Teal Fellowships, Fellowships that's and right. one of the first ones was Valeric Buterin, who uh, established Ethereum just five or six years ago, uh, which is a new blockchain based on uh, Satoshi's Bitcoin blockchain, but it improved and more generalized. And uh, he, he created the new blockchain, a new a uh, global computer platform, a new uh, programming language called Solidity, uh, a new currency to finance the a new form of smart contracts, which could be implemented on this new computer platform, a new source of uh, measurement for the value of the money in the energy consumption of the computer cycles required to implement the smart contracts, a huge new uh, compound uh, enterprise that in the last 12 months has essentially solved the IPO problem with ICOs. That's, inter that's initial uh, coin offerings, initial coin offerings, initial Cayman offerings, initial crypto offerings, and, and uh, They've raised $20 billion in uh, less than 12 months for thousands of new companies. Many of them have failed. Many of them have gone That's bust, the just like the Internet right. upsurge. But this but is an found amazing efflorescence that this, this uh, Valeric Buterin, who I think is one of the great entrepreneurs of, of our history, has accomplished in 12 months pretty much solved the IPO problem. It's the Chinese are rebelling because cryptocurrencies are global and the Chinese are skittish about anything that allows <laughs> uh, the globalization of Chinese capital that's not completely controlled. But right. anyway, uh, China is deeply involved in all these uh, new cryptocosmic developments. George, a special topic. You touch on it, you don't more than you discuss it at some length in Life After Google. It's not the central point, but it's a special topic. Artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. In Life After Google, you describe a 2017 conference of technologists at Asilomar, California. Quote, they gathered at Asilomar to alert the world to the dire threat posed by, well, by themselves, by Silicon Valley. Their computer technology, artificial intelligence, had gained such power and momentum that they now deemed it nothing less than a menace to mankind. To the Googleplex intellectuals, mathematics is essentially a doomsday machine." Close quote. And they're wrong? Yeah, they, they forgot Girdle. Uh, they, they, just, they, they just don't understand their own technology. It's, it's, it's sad, uh, but they don't. Okay, hold uh, on. They imagine that... The, the hold, hold on. They, you're talking about Elon Musk and his buddies, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the Googleplex Musk, intellectuals. Musk essentially funded that Asilomar okay. conference. However, now let me, I, I see you and I raise you, George. I'm going to he, listen to this intellectual. Henry Kissinger, yeah. writing in the Atlantic magazine this past spring, quote, Heretofore, the technological advance that most altered the course of modern history was the invention of the printing press in the 15th century. But now... 
the world is experiencing an even more sweeping technological revolution whose culmination may be a world relying on machines ungoverned by ethical or philosophical norms, close quote. Now you're taking on Henry Kissinger. Go uh, ahead. He, he was my tutor. At, uh, at Harvard in the old yeah, days? Yeah, he, okay. was my t he, he was assigned to be my tutor. I was uh, something of a rebellious student, and I never quite... Even then? Sick, well, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I loved Henry. He is a great man. Uh, and, and he has absorbed the Google system of the world. And he is wrong. The Why? artificial intelligence is a terrific uh, extension of human intelligence. It's, it requires an oracle just like any other machine extension. It's still a tool. It's still, it must, it's still, it's still a still tool. requires it, being held in a human hand in a certain sense. Yes, and it... And it, and it in no way usurps the human brain. That whole concept that somehow a machine can uh, usurp the human mind and it out and excel the human mind well, now is you, true now only if you say that the abacus uh, or the calculator excels the human mind. Of course they do in certain functions, but uh, when uh, Gary Kasparov competes with Big Blue, uh, Gary's using in 12 to 14 watts of energy and, as he, and is not connected to anything beyond his own uh, mind, while Big Blue is using essentially gigawatts of energy connected to those b big cloud data centers. And, you, you know, it, it's, uh, it just isn't. And, and moreover, there addressing a deterministic problem. And a deterministic problem can be solved by a machine. But deterministic problems are interesting, but irrelevant to information, as Claude Shannon showed. Information is defined as surprise. It's unexpected bits. It's entropy, as he called it. And surprise is the essence of human creativity. Surprises in a machine is a breakdown. It's bad news when your machine starts surprising you. And, and the way uh, uh, the Google people simulate creativity in machines is they introduce randomness to the machines. And they... they pretend that that is somehow simulating creativity. But, but randomness is minus information. They're subtracting information rather than adding it. It's just like their ads are actually minuses. Their creative inputs into their machines are actually minuses as well. All right. So here's what we all have in the backs of our minds. 2001 Space Odyssey in which Hal, he takes over the spaceship. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. It's a funny scene, but it's, a, it's of course, chilling. And at that re in those days, it was clearly, it was fiction, which was why it was funny. Yeah. But that's what everybody has in his mind, yeah. that the machines will take over. They'll start giving us orders. You said you were taught by Henry Kissinger, or you were supposed to have been taught by him. Another person you know well is Ray Kurzweil. I do. And, who is at Google now, and Ray Kurzweil wrote a book in 2005 entitled The Singularity is Near. And he argues that machines would become so intelligent that the distinction between computers and humans would disappear. Yeah. Hal would take over. And you say the machines will never be that smart, or you say it is in principle impossible. It it's doesn't in, matter how smart they are. Yeah, it's in principle impossible. Uh, that uh, machines do not, do not essentially think. Uh, they don't know anything. There are s systems of gates, of dumb components. Uh, they, they lack this creativity, which is epitomized in all the unexpected bits, the, 
the surprising results that human minds and imaginations can generate. All right. uh, com computers are deterministic, they're machines. And uh, Ray wrote a book called How to Create a Mind. It's a, it's a brilliant exposition of how to make a, a good speech recognizer. And, and in that book, he pretty much concludes that consciousness isn't really an issue. Consciousness is an emergent effect. It's an epiphenomenon of these machine processes that computer scientists understand. But this is just nonsense. If you don't understand consciousness, you don't understand thinking. Thinking doesn't produce consciousness. Consciousness compu uh, uh, produces thinking. And all these computer scientists are trying to explain away consciousness. But that's where, where we are. That's where we live. That's how we think. That's, that's the issue. Right. And to say, oh, well, uh, we don't know what consciousness is, but our machines are going to compute so fast that it won't matter, that, that consciousness will emerge like one of their clouds, uh, I think is, is just is just a, another fundamental vanity of the valley. Got it. Last questions, George. <clears throat> in your earlier book, Life After Television, published again in 1990, you predicted watches, computers as small as watches, speech recognition, mapping, navigation systems. You got a lot right. But you also predicted, this was in some ways the fundamental argument of the book, that as we went from broadcast television to the 500 channels of cable, and now, of course, we have the essentially infinite channels of Netflix and YouTube mm -hmm. and all the rest, this direct streaming, as we did that, programming would no longer need to cater to the lowest common denominator. denominator. So we would, not, we would no longer all be watching Claptrap, like the Beverly Hillbillies. You'd go online and you'd be able to pursue your interest in opera, someone else would be studying calculus, somebody else would be learning a language, we would be enlightened, we would be ennobled. Well, well that's true. Well, some of that has happened. Yeah. But you didn't tell us that porn was going to be absolutely pervasive. You didn't tell us that kids- I think I did tell you that porn would be In pervasive. life after television? I don't I think I mentioned that porn is, is, an, is is pretty hard to escape, uh, but anyway. Okay, so, but- uh, But or, I was wrong, I, got, I, I, uh, I was wrong But what I'm wrong trying to say, it was, it was a wonderfully optimistic, I still remember, yeah. I went through it in one reading, yeah. I started it at lunchtime and I yeah. neglected my work for the rest of the yeah. day because in any event, it was a wonderful book, but there, it didn't work out as happily no. as one would have expected from reading that book father of children, you're a father of children, you have a grandchild. We, the, kid, the kids have these phones in their hands yeah. so long that they, attention spans suffer, family yeah. conversations. Yeah. Here's Henry Kissinger again. Inundated via social media with the opinions of multitudes, users are diverted from introspection. These pressures weaken the fortitude required to develop and sustain convictions that can be implemented only by traveling a lonely road, which is the essence of creativity, close quote. What do you do with this argument that it didn't work out? Yeah. Technology has not ennobled us. It's made us passive and uncreative and lonely. Well, I think that's, I think we were passive, uncreative and lonely before. I think there's a, a certain illusion of a golden age that somehow we had privacy, we had creativity, we, attained virtue in a different way than we do today. Uh, I've, I'm sort of skeptical of the golden age idea, but I'm also uh, skeptical of the idea that this technology is the eschaton, that it's the final thing, that this- The blockchain, a what you're talking about. AI, oh, uh, the AI right. and all these Google right. era stuff that produced the effects that you're describing. And I agree with the effects you're describing, essentially. Uh, but, but I do believe that the blockchain and uh, related cryptographic technologies, it's part of a creative insurgency, do are a almost perfect answer to the problems that 
currently afflict the let, net. Let me that try they, one more. They provide this uh, distribution of intelligence and distribution of private rights and points of view that uh, right. has been lost to some extent in the cloud. Let me try one more line of attack on okay. an old friend who knows a thousand times more about all this than I do, but it's a layman's attack. Okay. And it's this. In Life After Television, published in 1990, and again, I can, I can just remember what, a, what an event it was to read that book. It was wonderfully optimistic. This is going to make things yeah. better. Well, actually, we have all the kludge that you were talking about, the, the ads we don't want, in yeah. all that we just discussed. And now you write Life After Google. This is it. Blockchain is going to solve all the problems. <laughs> and so... What about original sin? What about we're stuck with this? Or what about, I'm thinking now, we, you, come, you brush against theology, and I know it interests you. What about 20th century theologian Jacques Maritain, mm. who argued that as sin and redemption work themselves out in history, things are getting better, but also worse at the same time. And that is the human condition. So even blockchain is another tool. It will be morally neutral. It'll have wonderful benefits, but it may have significant costs. I'm trying to get George Gilder to accept some piece of the tragic view of life. Uh, well, I, I've, I love the Unamuno's, the tragic view of life. Ortega y Gasset was one of my favorite I know, philosophers. I all right. uh, but, uh, and so I accept the tragic view of life. But we're all going to die. We're all... Blockchain uh, won't solve that one. Uh, blockchain won't solve that one. Blockchain won't solve many of the uh, intrinsic torments of life and sin on this earth. I, I readily acknowledge that. Blockchain is part of the public world where the great human adventures are conducted, the great new companies are launched, the, the uh, continued dynamism of human cre creativity is expressed. And, and uh, what I'm arguing against is what Bill Buckley used to call immanentizing the eschaton, imagining that some technology that you've come up with last week is the final technology that will end the human adventure, that will subsume all our minds in, in the clouds, uh, governed by eight giant companies in China and the U.S. and with some uh, few nerds in Israel contributing all the new ideas. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the vision that I don't think is going to prevail. I think the human adventure will continue after Google. George Gilder, author of Life After Google, thank you. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thanks for joining us.